the reigning tree here is also amphibious, the mangrove. There are a dozen or so varieties. Fazul Ok is a biologist. He spent his entire career working to understand the incredible mechanism that allows the mangrove to adapt to what no other forest can stand up to. Tidal ebb and flow. This is a metaphor. You can tell from its shape which tree it's from. This is the pneumatophore of the Sundari mangrove tree. It's flat and very hard. The upper part is pointed. As it is flooded twice daily, the soil in the Sundarban mangrove is poor in oxygen. Mangroves have a unique and ingenious way of breathing. Pneumatophores, a kind of breathing tube that grow upward from their roots. When the tide's low, the trees breathe through the pores of their pneumatophores, called lenticels. At high tide, the lenticels close and trap the air inside the tree. The tree uses the oxygen and releases carbon dioxide into the water. Mangrove forests trap five times more carbon dioxide than other forests in the world. The mangrove's other amazing feat is that it's able to thrive in salt water. To cope with salinity, the mangrove filters out the salt, then absorbs the water. The tree then excretes the salt that's been filtered through its leaves. The ingenious mangrove has also managed to put the tides to good use for reproduction. Rather than run the risk of drowning or asphyxiating its seeds, they germinate directly on the tree. After getting swept by the currents at high tide, the seedlings fall and take root in the sludge at low tide. After that, everything happens fast. The tree's root system emerges in one day and the first leaves in less than 10. In two years' time, the mangroves are already several meters tall. This dense root system has an amazing attribute. It anchors trees in a particularly solid way, allowing them to act like a fence to slow down wind and water. Though they may not be able to stop a tsunami, mangroves can reduce the damage caused by the fierce cyclones in the Bay of Bengal. Mangroves offer precious defense for the entire country. But the mangrove forest is much more than a cluster of trees. What we have here is a complex and diversified food chain. Each living creature plays an important role. When the water recedes, it reveals a whole realm of curious creatures. Like the mudskipper, an amphibious fish perfectly capable of living on land during low tide. 
Its eyes are fully independent from one another, which not only gives it a broad field of vision, but allows it to see both under and above the water. But the true engineer of the mangrove is this guy, the crab. As an omnivore, it eats everything it can find, from mangrove leaves to dead animals. And in doing so, it recycles the ecosystem. Its larvae are the main food source for fish, and it aerates the sand with the long holes it burrows. The Sundarbans mangrove is brimming with crustaceans, fish, birds, and mammals, a real horn of plenty. The men and women who settled here some 200 years ago knew what they were doing. But in order to get their hands on the mangrove's treasures, they had to come to terms with its guardian, the tiger. For two centuries, only the most daring and destitute have braved this highly dangerous, yet nurturing and fertile environment. Its inhabitants have long led an existence in harmony with the resources the forest has to offer. Shukuma has been fishing since he was old enough to work. He lives in a small village in the mangrove forest. He uses traditional fishing methods with a net, like his father and grandfather before him. We're together in happiness and in sadness. We try to eke out a living from fishing, and we work to meet our family's needs. The harmonious balance Shukumar alludes to has been challenged the past few years. The numbers of fish are dwindling. The people in the heart of the forest are growing concerned. There aren't enough fish left to support a whole family. A lot of fishermen are giving up and heading to other regions. Those who stay have to venture deeper into the forest. Now, an entire day's catch is barely enough to live off for two days. We need to find a different livelihood in our village, or else go find work in another region. We needn't travel very far to figure out why there are so few fish. Here we are on the edge of the mangrove forest along the coast of the Bay of Bengal. During the five-month dry season, this temporary village bustles with 15,000 fishermen. The fish is dried for export. Tightly woven nets don't let anything through. Crustaceans, eggs, fry, everything is destroyed the fish can't manage to reproduce anymore. So with the decreasing fish supplies, the entire country has turned to an activity that has proven lucrative, shrimp farming. In 20 years, Bangladesh has become the world's sixth ranking producer of shrimp. The country's second greatest economic activity after textiles. An El Dorado for families fleeing shanty towns and the instability of city work. At high tide, hundreds of fishermen retrieve their nets of shrimp fry, which they sell to farmers, who then place them in nursery ponds. But therein lies the problem. Shrimp farming 
is an ecological disaster. Abdul Chaudhuri is a professor of environmental science. For 20 years, he's watched the shrimp industry wreak havoc with the Sundarbans and completely reshape its landscape. There are a lot of shrimp in the Sundarbans, but there are too many producers, and that means over-farming. On the one hand, the fishermen manage to make a living by collecting shrimp. But on the other hand, they destroy other natural resources by catching the eggs and fry a fish endemic to the region. And the water kept in the ponds of shrimp farms in the villages is changing the quality of the soil and water. The water kills freshwater fish in favor of shrimp. Shrimp are farmed in saltwater ponds supplied with water from the canals. The soil is porous and lets the salt through, where it contaminates the reserves of fresh water needed for rice paddies, which are gradually disappearing. Drinking water in the villages gets polluted by the chemicals used in shrimp aquaculture. But most importantly, the mangrove's ability to absorb salt has hit its limit, and the trees are dying. The stabilizing action of the mangrove forest has been compromised, leaving coastal zones and villages vulnerable to destruction from frequent storms. If this continues, the Sundarbans are going to lose their natural resources, both in terms of animal and plant life. The mangrove ecosystem won't be the same, and the entire country of Bangladesh will suffer the consequences. Since the shrimp rush began, one million people have depended on the mangrove forest for their survival. They represent a massive drain on the forest's resources. The result? Unprecedented deforestation, a disturbed ecosystem, and tiger attacks. The tigers of the Sundarbans have been man-eaters ever since villages have sprung up near their territory. To survive, a male tiger needs a surface area of 100 square kilometers. Deer, its prey of choice, is also hunted by humans, of whom there are more and more. Man and tiger. The mangrove has become too small for these two big predators. And tigers, which are excellent swimmers, are infamous for attacking fishing boats. Wait, I think there's a tiger print there. Go closer to that bank. To the right there? Closer. Yes, it's right there. I can't see very well, but there's something on the other side. Yeah, let's cross. The tiger that walked here is very big. The large circular print indicates an adult male. Now I'm going to measure it. 10 centimeters at the heel and in length 11.5 centimeters. An adult male weighing over 250 kilograms. We can also deduct how old the print is. The insect grooves tell us it's not recent. I'd say the tiger came by here about 24 hours ago. Tigers may have become man-hunters, but humans in turn have become tiger hunters. The demand for products derived from the big cats is very high in Asia. 
Each part of the tiger, skin, teeth, bones, sells at a high price. Another threat comes from people living along the forest edge. When a tiger comes out of the forest, it gets killed. Three hundred and fifty thousand people work in the mangrove. Fishermen must venture deeper and deeper into the forest to find fish. Their only security against tigers, invoking the goddess Bonbibi, protector of the Sundarbans. Two years ago, Shukumal was fishing when he found himself face to face with a tiger. The tiger pounced on me. I didn't have time to protect myself. It sank its claws into my eye and chest. I lost a huge amount of blood. Part of my head was here, on my shoulder. Shukumal owes his life to the incredible bravery of his two sisters-in-law, who were fishing with him that day. I struck the tiger twice with a stick. The tiger let go and fled. I bound his wound with my sari. It was soaked with blood. She closed up my skull with her hand and held it in place with her sari. I couldn't abandon him. We'd gone there together and we would leave together. When we got back, the people who greeted our boat said, they saved him from the fangs of a tiger, something ten men couldn't have done. They're wild animals, but they protect our forest. Tigers kill people, but I don't believe they're angry at humans. It's probably our own fault. That's why. Thank <laughs> you.